Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 184. This episode is with actor, director, coach, and my new friend, Walt Gray IV. Not only is he a fantastic artist, but he's also a great example of paying your dues and working your way up in the entertainment industry. In this episode, we talk about him working on Shakespeare, getting a lead role in high school by accident, going to UCLA for grad school, working on an episode of The Newsroom, taking a life-changing motion capture class from the legendary Gordon Hunt, working as a PA at the Sony mocap stages, what his responsibilities were there, going from a PA to a reader to a performer, how important communication is, working on a bunch of amazing games, and so much more. We talk about a ton because Walt is awesome. He's a great dude, and I'm so excited for you to get to know him. So, without further ado... Please enjoy this episode of the Interesting Podcast, number 184, with Walt Gray IV. Theme song time. got me in a weird position because you're one of the select few people I've hung out with who've actually listened to an episode. Multiple episodes because I have <laughs> multiple friends that you have already talked to and the consensus from the few that I've talked to just like, oh, I love Brian. Great. <laughs> got him. I also have blackmail on all of them and I look forward to adding you to the list just in case you understand. I'm, I'm used to it. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have do you have rehearsal tonight? We've opened, so there's no more rehearsals. Um, How's it been? It's been good. Um, we had four shows. The show on Monday night was for a literal busload of Xena fans. I guess there was a Xena retreat this weekend. And nice. um, we had like 87 people or something Dude. for a Monday night show. And um, yeah, they were very psyched to be there and a very... Cool. We had a very enthusiastic, captive audience to watch three and a half hours of Romeo and Juliet. Whew. Yeah. How do you memorize Shakespeare? Because you're doing Romeo and Juliet now and you just came off of Macbeth. You uh, repetition. Yeah. Like everything. Yeah. It helps that you know what you're saying. And, I, and I'm point. saying I'm saying that for any line. Sure. Any, any script. Like if you don't know. And with Shakespeare, it takes me a few passes before I go, oh, this is a, you know, he's making a really cool metaphor here. Or um, this is what I'm actually saying. This, this is an operative. I need to punch for this to be the antithesis. There's a lot of antitheses sure. in Shakespeare, as you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that, okay. that, that way, <laughs> you just, <laughs> just keep at it. I think, I think Mackers has something like 710 lines. Oh. in the script and we cut it down our, our Macbeth was cut down considerably okay so that helps I, I only had like 400 some 500 lines maybe a little warm-up did you have to get a cast made of your head for for Macbeth okay. no no they um the producer's husband is like a legit uh fx guy from Hollywood from the movies he has oh, cool. worked on he has worked on many a movie you and I have enjoyed. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, he just had extra heads in his garage. And of I, course. Sent, I sent in pictures and he, you know, made the nose look more like mine. And he tried to get the facial hair right. And um, I have pictures. I can send them to you of just cool. the head, um, you know, get the bald spot right, all this yeah. stuff. So <laughs> he had heads. He just it, then he was able to, like, change it just a little bit so that on stage it looks enough like me. That's pretty cool. Is it true that you are from the smaller, possibly lesser known Pennsylvania? Is there a is there a, a better known Pennsylvania than the Pennsylvania? You mean in general? In, I mean, in there's the a states? state called Pennsylvania and yes. then there's a Pennsylvania in Indiana. There's an Indiana in Pennsylvania, which is where I'm from. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> My brain got crossed and I got it backwards. <laughs> yeah. And there's an Indiana University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> Which is very convenient because there's an Indiana University. I could uh -huh. go on and on. Uh, they just, I feel like back in the day, they just ran out of, you know, it's like New England. What do we <laughs> right. call this? Uh, let's call it um, 
England? No, we did that already. Uh, how about a New England? Ooh, New England, I like that. <laughs> I like that quite a bit. What do we call this? Jersey? No, we have a Jersey. A New Jersey. It'll be the <laughs> epicenter of art and culture. It'll be fantastic. Right. And it didn't get better with the West expansion. It'll be like, there's Mexico. Well, hey, I got an idea. <laughs> New Mexico. <laughs> anyway, yes. Indiana, Pennsylvania. Indiana, Pennsylvania. And you went to the university indiana university of pennsylvania yes that was a lot undergrad that's the only that's the only college that accepted me my mother was a teacher there for a number of years cool the 70s she taught french she taught wow senior synthesis course (laughs) at some point i think they just let the teachers what do you want to teach (laughs) senior synthesis course and mom was like i love marcel proust i love the titanic and you know Boom. Right before I started going there, Titanic happened and she saw it 80,000 times like every other <laughs> mother in the country. Respect. And then uh, the Romanovs. And it was all around the same time, the turn of the century. You know, oh. 19, early, ni- the, the first decade and going into 1912 and on. She was just, so that time period, she taught a class about that, which is why I know so much about Proust or make Proustian references that no one gets. <laughs> I love it. Like, yeah, it's just like the end of Ratatouille when he has that flashback. I'm like, that's uh, that's actually from Proust, but that's okay. I'm right? glad you you're enjoying it. <laughs> We're halfway there. <laughs> At this point, I, I prefer Rakakuni anyway. Did oh, I make right, Rakakuni. Ra- yeah, you yeah. did first try. <laughs> I want to see that movie. Do you speak French then? Not well. Okay. No. Did you try? I tried. We, she used to, my mom used to fly to Paris all the time as, you know, a teacher just oh, wow. going on uh, either if there were trips with IUP students or, uh, but she used to go like once a year or once every couple of years. And when I was a child, a, a like toddler, sure, barely, barely a thinking human being, I would go with them <laughs> on trips. And so very early on, I got a great a great cultural awakening, I think, as a child that has helped me appreciate other other languages and other other um well definitely France. That's cool. It's been a while. I haven't been to France since 2005. And okay. I know it was 2005 because Sin City and Batman Begins were in the theater with ah, uh, it's a good time. With French subtitles. Yeah. Do you find that you speak more French or understand more French? Or are they about the same? I think I understand more French, but it's very, you got to understand. I'm not <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> a fluent French. I'm not Yuri Lowenthal. Okay? Sure. I don't. A few people not, are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I, 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 I used to know it. I took French in high school. I f- practically failed it. Sure. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I think when your parent is a teacher of a certain subject, at least for me, mm-hmm. when your parents are a teacher of a certain subject, for whatever reason, you want to rebel against it. I'm not going to learn French because you teach it. Ew. Right. Very dumb. Very yep. dumb. If I had a way to convince my younger self, soak this up, learn this language. It'd be really cool later. But I can ask where the bathroom is and I can ask for steak and fries with a giant Coke if Boom. I wanted to. What more it's do you, you need? need? Really? Exactly. <laughs> Please feed me. Where's the restroom? Especially right. after you eat steak right. and fries and a giant Coke. <laughs> I had a friend who said he wanted to learn how to say I don't speak this language in as many languages <laughs> as possible. In, in perfect diction. Too. Yeah. <laughs> just like and they're, they're, so they get very confused. Like that yeah. sound that was you said that beautifully. <laughs> what are you talking about? Right. So your mom was a teacher. What did your dad do? He was a clinical psychologist. Wow. Um he he went to grad school back in the day, earlier 60s. Um for acting and directing and he got his master's in both and at a certain point from what i remember he he wanted to um study psychology so he would be a better actor smart and then i think after a while he realized oh i'm good at the psychology stuff oh i can get paid really well if i have a private practice so he got that going um for himself so he was licensed private clinical psychologist and then he also uh was court appointed by a lot oh. of, if if there was drug and alcohol abuse in a in a case or something, sure, he would get called in to work with them. So he specialized in that. 
Uh, he also did family therapy. He also worked uh, for the Department of Corrections for a while, and he was um, at a prison in, I want to say nice. Greensburg, Greensburg, Pennsylvania, not too far from us, but I could be wrong. It was years ago. It was another sure. life, so I can't, I just know it was a giant um, big old prison, brick prison, but he was the psychologist on duty there for a while. Um yeah interesting yeah is it, so is that where the interest in acting started because you know your dad had an interest in it no again um i think well as as a there's there's old tapes from uh christmas time of you know dad getting me like a toy guitar because dad also played folk music dude and he was a singer and um it's so cool in the, in the 60s he was a, he was a folk singer and loved folk music i grew up on folk music and neil diamond and yeah the good the good stuff get it still listen to it um and still pretend to be able to play guitar (laughs) um but there there's a video old christmas videos of him trying to like get me interested in music and playing music and i just never cared until you know you get to high school and college and go oh uh, girls like it when you can Uh play guitar and sing hey dad (laughs) you teach me a little (laughs) bit of this (laughs) <laughs> like you dumbass i tried to do this years ago right um but yeah so so at first he was trying to get me into music which he succeeded at um more or less and then um he tried to he he was one of the founders of our um our community theater indiana oh, players dude back in the 70s he was one of the the founding members and they're still going as far as i i know i hope they still are I hope sure um but uh, so he was active in the community like that before I was born. And um, so, so he, never, he never tried to push acting on to me. I think it's, it wasn't until I, got, I went to high school or I went to the Kiskey School, which is an all boys prep school. Oh, from, there you uh, go. 1888 is when they're, uh, they were founded. Um, they're still kicking today. So. Wow privately funded, you know, alumni and whatnot, um, sure. go on to do bigger and better things and give money back to the school. It's a coat and tie, clean shaven haircut, oh boy. dead poet society without the suicide. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hopefully, um, re- really good school. And, um, anyway, that's while I was there, there were, uh, there was an English teacher, Mr. Tadler, uh, Bill Tadler. And, uh, he was just so eccentric. He was just one of those eccentric teachers that you yeah. have, hopefully, whether it's a science teacher or an English teacher or a, or a, or a theater you know, teacher. And he was so funny and so quick and just fun to, to be around. Mm-hmm. And he was, directing, he was directing shows. And one of the shows, I think my, it's my freshman year, I think my freshman year, I just watched their shows and um, didn't, didn't get involved. I think it was sophomore year. They were doing doing "Don't Drink the Water" with Woody Allen's uh, Ooh, "Don't Drink yeah. the Water," and I I got a part in it as like the Russian, uh, you know, guy that works at the embassy, running around trying to get the main characters caught and get stuck it. in Russia. And then the lead, Mike Solon. Oh, good, my dogs are fighting each other now. <laughs> um, Mike Solon, the lead, had such terrible grades that he was pulled out of the show. Oh, no. I want to say eight days before we opened or something like that, eight or seven, like a week or so before we opened and um, said, Hey, Walt, can you pick this up in eight days and learn these lines and uh, take over the lead for the show? And um, no idea what I was doing. I, if there's video of it somewhere, I know it's awful. (laughs) It's also, it's also going to be on one of those little, you know, RCA tapes. Oh yeah. Like it's, which so thankfully we, I don't think we can find it or play it anymore. Right. Um, <laughs> but I'm sure it was a terrible performance. And then the very next show was Glass Menagerie, Tennessee Dude, Williams. Yeah. So I was not prepared for any of that. <laughs> no. But um, during Glass Menagerie, I kind of recognized, and especially because my dad was getting excited that I was I was starting to cut my teeth. It's the expression, right? Uh-huh. On um, on theater, he. Uh, was helping me with, you know, 
and you're in a theater and project the the back of the house needs to be able to hear you and stuff mm -hmm. like that and um that was 2002 is when i did that production at an all boys high school and um you know for the female parts there's a there's a, a high school regular public high school across the river in salzburg mm -hmm. pa and we had friends of uh faculty members or, or kids of faculty members that wanted to act like young young women that were doing shows cool. like you know doing guys and dolls over there at the high school and then they sure. would come over and do glass menagerie with us or whatever so it wasn't all it wasn't like shakespeare times where it was all guys yeah doing <laughs> all the parts other, then the the boys would never have taken it seriously good point um so we we made it work um but yeah so there was a lot of jumping in the deep end um Get with it. the material those shows in a place that i didn't uh, expect i was never a big sports guy either i suck at sports ditto i don't i don't love i grew up in steelers country which mm -hmm. is very aggressive yeah <laughs> you and, guys threw snowballs at santa uh, see <laughs> i'm not surprised <laughs> to hear that i i am all for people in loving what they love and i am all ditto. for I, I want people to enjoy what they enjoy i don't want people getting hurt over it i don't mm -hmm. want people being uh physically or verbally abused over it yeah and um so i i try to i try to respect <laughs> other people's loves but i i also try to be wary if it gets dumb right <laughs> let's By do dumb, constructive I mean, passion i'm dumb i mean violent and hurtful yep. towards other people which i feel like it's so easy to do with a lot of sports fans For but especially sure. especially where i'm from yeah <laughs> i am not better than these people i am i have gotten very upset over many a star wars thing but i yeah. <laughs> would like to think i'm not one of those toxic star wars fans that sure. just stops talking to people insult someone's mother right or whatever i just i'm i'm getting to an age where i go we have a limited amount of time <laughs> on this dying planet and it's gonna be sped up before it gets slowed down anytime soon mm -hmm. we should all enjoy what we enjoy and be kind to each other so that's kind of where i am now agreed we're cut from the same cloth went off on a tangent there but yes it's all i do tangents that's all i do <laughs> Which means this, this interview is going to go nowhere. <laughs> They've been talking in circles about Lord of the Rings for 20 minutes. I'm gonna... They're Listen used to, to it now. Yeah, this that's is good. like 184, something like that. Congratulations, man. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's it's, awesome. I mean, you know, it's not me. <laughs> it is, though. I, I'm, a, I'm a facilitator. I just, right. I just trick people into hanging out with me. Which you know? means it's you. I mean, you have to say yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you do. But everyone that has said yes, I think have had a, from what I can hear and oh, who I've talked it. to, they're, they've enjoyed out. themselves. It's wonderful. <laughs> Take some credit. I'm, I'll eventually get to that point. I'm, I'm working on it. I'm getting, I'm getting better at it. That's all we can do is, you is know, work on it. Exactly. Exactly. I can't believe you took a lead role in a week. That's a lot. Me neither. Well, and that's why it wasn't very good. Sure. <laughs> that's fair. I'm supposed to play this, you know, middle-aged Jewish man on vacation in Russia. Um, yeah, I didn't do a good job. <laughs> There's pictures somewhere and I just look like a high school kid. I didn't put any makeup on. I didn't, I had no idea what I was doing. Sure. I, I, I remember just coasting through it and it wasn't until I was forced, I say forced, I wanted to do it, but until... Yeah. Tennessee Williams was put in my hands and I went, yeah. oh, okay. People take this pretty seriously. Maybe I should too. Yeah. And uh, you can't take it with you was the Ooh. year after that. And that was a lot of Great fun. One. And I got to be uh, the the ballet, the Russian ballet instructor, Polenkov. Get it. Um, hey, typecast right out the gate. Well, which going is on? crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and I couldn't, I couldn't grow a beard yet um because of <laughs> school but what was crazy about that is and that wasn't the last show we did but that was one of the shows and then when i jumped over to um uh iup for my undergrad mm -hmm. one of the first shows as uh that they were doing was you can't take it with you and i got oh. the same part <laughs> so i got to do it again get it which is great wow what what was it that like kept you going like was it just a genuine when, once it clicked mountain dew yeah <laughs> <laughs> way too i drank fuel way of champions. too much i drank way too much mountain dew in my teenage years <laughs> high school undergrad 
it worked like more than I should have than any Still human kicking. should. Con- yeah. <laughs> I haven't touched the stuff in years. Um, now it's like nitrous to you. If you get one I drop. Can't. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, I have a heart thing. It's, it's normal. Apparently it's sure. a right, right bundle branch block where, um, Oh, the electricity doesn't, uh, if you had like a, a points of contact on a wire and it uh-huh. just go a to b to c right uh mine goes a to b uh we don't have a connection to c so now we're going to go all the way around the heart and and electrify that side of the heart so it pumps so Whoa. it takes like a split second longer to pump correctly really uh, nobody told me this wasn't a big deal until after all the ekgs and everything and I, was, <laughs> of course. I was having uh panic attacks in general and i thought there was something wrong with my chest and whatever sure. haven't in a while but um huh. now thankfully i it? know it's like no okay. no you can't you can't feel it um it's just something it's just you know my heart's beating but sure. it's just if you put an ekg on me they're gonna say you have an irregular heartbeat and it's oh. that thing um, so learning that was cool. That, yeah. was only, that was only a few years ago, 2018 or 2017, it was just 2017. I think I learned about that. Interesting. So when you're going, you do high school and then you go and continue pursuing acting was the goal theater or was it any medium you could at the time? Yeah. Because I yeah. didn't, I don't, I didn't know a world outside of Western Pennsylvania. So sure. Makes um, sense. I, I was a very lazy kid and I'm now <laughs> a very lazy adult. And so as far as like, I remember one time we, we, we drove up to Pittsburgh. It's like an hour and a half drive from where we live because there was a agency thing, some company, there's these companies and you've probably seen them in your life where it's just like, Hey, for tweens and teenagers and stuff, we're having a, a cattle mm-hmm. call and we're going to see what kids we can put on our roster for this yep. uh, sunny D commercial or whatever it is. Sure. And so we went to this weird cattle call. Um, it was very shady. Uh, it, was in, <laughs> it was in a building somewhere in Pittsburgh. I mean, I, I say shady because like they came out and they're telling us about it, and, but there's no like, there's no audition. It was sure. just show up and people, I guess they would go, that kid looks cute they can right. sell <laughs> that'll Barbies. do i don't know <laughs> and then they like they like let the owner of the company out of his cryogenic chamber for a second this old old dude in a suit just kind of came out and waved and uh good luck everybody like right. what <laughs> this could be you <laughs> <laughs> you work hard you'll be like me someday please no Right. anyway the whole the whole thing left a bad taste in my mouth and i think it left a bad taste in dad's mouth and so we both we both were like i'm good i don't right. <laughs> i don't foresee me working out of pittsburgh as a kid anytime soon and fair so yeah went to went to undergrad went got into the theater department just started doing shows having wonderful uh classmate relationships with so many other talented individuals started our own sketch comedy group called the company. Cause we couldn't Ooh, think of classic. Any, any kind of, <laughs> thankfully we were, we were good. Okay. Okay. I'm sure. A lot that of people helps. say that, but um, <laughs> right. there were some bad sketches. Don't get me of wrong. Course. There's some really bad sketches that didn't land. A lot of them were like, you know, time uh, sensitive, like to the, whenever we did. Sure. Them. So it was like 2000, what 2005 or 2006. Then that's, you know, sure. The big story was at the time. But um, we did okay. I did. We I remember one of my favorite things we did was a uh, a cold open of uh, a James Bond montage because Ooh. I, I'm an insane uh, James Bond fan. Good. And uh, my friend Nate, who was in the company, we just wrote this whole thing set to music of like different theme songs from different films. And uh, at that time, Casino Royale had just come out. So the last Ooh. one was the, you know, Chris Cornell, you know, my name. Uh huh. So we did like the whole, like, you know, barrel thing with a spotlight on the, on the stage. What? And it was really fun. Th- that I do have a tape of somewhere that isn't completely destroyed. And I wish we'd uploaded all these to YouTube, but <clears throat> I don't know. I'll find it. But it was, but things like we would do things like that. And, and other people would have really fun, really talented uh, students that would write sketches and, 
anyway, this is all coming up as I'm thinking about my yeah. time at IUP, and that was some of my favorite, some of my favorite theater that we that we did. How could and it not then, be? Um, yeah, and then we did we did um, you know some big main stage shows, which were really fun, and so just furthering my education. At the end of all that, uh, February of 2008. Some of us, uh, a few of us students were um, requested, pushed, suggested that we <laughs> go to um, ERTA's, which is the, uh, I'm going to mess up the acronym. It's like University Residence Theater or something association. You, you get, you basically a bunch of students go to uh, Chicago or New York or Vegas or LA and all these schools go there and you audition for a bunch of different schools for grad schools. Oh, okay. It's a grad school That's audition cool. cattle call thing. And it's embarrassing that I can't remember what the act <laughs> like a is, showcase but... kind of thing. Yeah. And so there's like three levels of auditions. Uh, you do one. And then if you get that, you get to the second. And if you get that, then you get to the final one where most of the schools get to see you. And then if you're lucky, schools will reach out to you and say, okay, at two o'clock today, come by the Hilton in Chicago at this room or, you know, this, this multi-purpose room and we'll have you in our auditions or whatever. Ooh. I did not know what the LA and UCLA meant. Again, lazy, sure. lazy kid. I was <laughs> coasting. I was very fortunate, very lucky. And um, just, just a, you, know, you had to have like a Shakespeare monologue, a contemporary piece. Um, Dude. And then something, you, this is, I mean, people still do this, which is, I think, good. But you, they always say you have something in your back pocket. Uh -huh. can, you, can you give us a Shakespeare? Sure. Blah, 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 blah. blah. Right. Great. Can you give us some Arthur Miller or Tennessee Williams? Uh, yeah, I got it. And like this, we were expected to just have them ready to go. Get it. So lucky enough that um, I got into the third round of auditions and Mel Shapiro was there from UCLA and asked me and a select other few to, you know, go, go into a one last audition with them. And then uh, a few weeks later, after I got home, got the notice that I was in they were and uh, they, because uh, of the time difference, they had emailed me at like, nine o'clock at night i think pa time so it was like 6 p.m la uh -huh. time so my parents were already i don't know if they were asleep but they were already in the bedroom mm -hmm. and i like I, I taped the the acceptance letter up onto their door so that was i love the first it thing they saw in the morning and it wasn't until then that my mom said oh maybe he could do this for a living if he got in <laughs> to ucla because she always never she's she had no idea what i was going to do with my life sure um they were both very supportive of me as an individual, but I think, mm -hmm. again, lazy kid, they probably thought sure. I was going to be, I'm an only child, so probably thought I was just going to be aimless or figure something out or stay in PA. I don't know. Right. But I, but I got in in 2008, flew out, uh, left home and uh, uh, went to grad school for three years and um, another great education there, learned so much. My voice and speech got uh, improved significantly. My grammar hasn't clearly, yeah. but um, <laughs> how how I can speak, hopefully. Sure. Um, and then again, a bunch of awesome shows and meeting other uh, talented people, 15 hour days with classes mm -hmm. and then whatever shows we're doing, just very intense stuff for three years. After that, uh, they had a showcase. UCLA has a showcase at the end of all their MFA um, tracks and uh, it's either it's usually at the Geffen and we had a showcase and that consists of an onstage scene with you and a classmate and then an on-camera um, monologue that you filmed oh. earlier so they can see what you look like on screen sure uh, then also on stage and they would invite casting directors and managers and agents and thankfully, at the time, Koopman Management came to that. They saw me and they said, hey, how don't you come to the boutique, small, why don't you come with us? I said, sure, let's try this out. Had some auditions for a little while. And then uh, they eventually got me on the newsroom in 2013. Wow. Um, but during all that, coming out of school, losing my financial aid, eventually, uh -huh. I had like three part-time jobs. I was like, I'm not going to be able to afford rent if I don't do something. Sure. So I was a town car driver for a while, which was like 
4 a.m. calls to pick up somebody at LAX at like 5 a.m. And Dude. they're usually rich and yep. they almost always know how to get home better and quicker than you do at any sure. hour. <laughs> um, that was also a coat and tie deal, you know, like a town Got car it. is a nice service. Uh-huh. Uh, I was stocking shelves at World Market. Nice. Plus, plus, um, and at this around the same time, getting into uh, being a PA uh, at Sony for motion capture. Um, and I'm just kind of going through all the main points here because I have yeah, yeah. a feeling what you want to ask and how I do it. <laughs> so I'm just like, let's get all this out so we can geek right. out about stuff. Sure. It's fun to watch because I know you've listened to episodes. So it's like, I think he has an idea of what I'm going to do. So how do I how do I mix it up? <laughs> well, I want to I want to I wanna streamline it because right. anybody that knows me and my fiance, especially I ramble. I love and it. I I love it, too, except I rarely get to the point. quickly. Right. <laughs> and I know if I'm driving down to rehearsal and I'm listening to the interesting podcast, the last uh-huh. thing I want is just, you know, someone just being like, yeah, and then I did this. And then I oh, wait, I was listening to this. I was <laughs> right. listening to this thread. What happened right. after high school? How did you get into this? Why are you talking about this now? What, go back to that thing. You asshole. Why am I spending my time on this? Here's anyway. the difference between me and everyone else, though. And you know this. I don't interview people. I hang out and I'm interested in all of it. So yeah. I actually want to know. You said you hadn't been outside of like the Pennsylvania area beforehand. So you hadn't been to California before going to UCLA? I had not. How was that? Very different. Yes. Moving, moving to Cal- I, We visited when I got like dad and I went out okay. and, you know, saw the Chinese theater and sure, uh, took, in the, took in the sights and, um, uh, you know, and, and went to UCLA to check it out because you want to sure know, figure out, OK, how's this going to work? Get your figure out my graduate housing, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but other than that, yeah, I'd never. And to answer your question, it is a I still feel this way. When I first came out here, it's just the idea of a melting pot of cultures yeah. and food and uh, people. And I was also not surprised, but I was pleasantly overcome with how nice everyone seemed. Yeah. Even just f- random folks on the street. I really wasn't, I guess, living so close to New York and I barely visited New York. Like I never mm-hmm. went to New York, but just, you know, that stereotype of like everyone's uh-huh. busy in a hurry and they're kind of jerks and they're not going to, they're not going to be nice to you. Everybody I felt in LA was nice. Yeah. It's not always the case now, of course. Um, but I, I was just, I was happy to find that the strange new world I found myself in was more welcoming than not. But I was also in a bubble. Again, every time I've done acting, I've been in a bubble. I was in high school in a bubble. I was in a bigger bubble at IUP. And now I'm in a bubble at UCLA. Still, gotcha. like financial aid is helping keeping me sure living in this very expensive city. Okay. So... Yeah, it was it was it was a good culture shock. And I think after the I couldn't tell you who specifically, which maybe is a good thing. But I think after the third (laughs) or fourth public celebrity sighting, like, you know, walking through Westwood and I just walk past. I'm like, that was Brent Spiner. Holy shit. Right. Cool. (laughs) It's real. (laughs) Um, Didn't say anything. Didn't say hi to the guy, but just kind of like, oh, just recognizing that someone from a small town who loves movies and grew yeah. up on movies, seeing some of the people that helped shape those experiences in real life, walking around minding their own business was helpful to take the, you know, the awe of celebrity out, especially later when I started working at Sony and we started getting some, some big, big types in, but yeah, interesting. so okay. really cool, overwhelming in the best possible way. And again, I, I was in a bubble of, education and lovely people and was always busy with that and learning and sure a better actor and hopefully a better person but was the education different than you expected because it's i mean one of the best schools for it i had no expectations again i didn't know i didn't know what the la and ucla meant Um, right but yeah we were very lucky i know it's a different program now but at the time from 2008 to 2011 when we graduated the the teachers that were there were the best in cool some of the best in the country so movement uh stage combat um you know directing acting shakespeare um voice and speech especially 
mm-hmm. all of it was so instrumental to, and what's great about UCLA, and I'm, I'm sure they still do this, I hope they do, is they <laughs> will introduce you to Meisner, and they will introduce you to Linklater and Uta Hagen, and, and I did a lot of Stanislavski in undergrad, that's where I learned a lot of my acting. Cool. But they'll say there are multiple approaches to the right. same text, to the same character. And instead of them going, you must use this, you, you must always do Meisner. They would go, what works best for you as a human being? What can you relate to in this moment for this character? Maybe this link later exercise will help find something. So they were very good about going, here's a bunch of different approaches. Run with it. Let's see oh, what that's happens. That's cool. It's like cultivating the artist. It, yeah, hopefully. Uh, cultivating the artist and hopefully the artist is open enough and uh to to fail and um mm-hmm. and just do it again whatever failure is right yeah are you good at that giving yourself permission to fail i am now okay um when i finally realized i was about to say there's no wrong or way right way to act but i don't think that's true i right <laughs> everything's subjective art is subjective sure one one person's performance by two different audience members might either be the best thing that one person has ever seen in their lives Mm-hmm. Then the other the other person, the audience next to him might think, oh, my God, that was oh, sure. Um, and so that is fascinating and interesting. And the whole point of consuming art, I think it's why we have it's why we do have uh, divides in the Star Wars world or or, you know, mm-hmm. with a Bond film or, or uh, with Marvel. My God. Yeah. Um, my biggest thing is if uh, if the work is genuinely obtained acquired presented Mm -hmm. if the actor did the work right and whatever they're doing is specific and justified to them it will be specific and justified to the audience member hopefully even if it's not the choice we would we would pick so you still see oh they're there they're in it they're 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 showing us a character yeah that's awesome i think that's everything i i think it's it's easy for all of us to tell when we're when we don't buy it it's like i don't buy that i don't buy that moment Sure. And it's very easy as a performer, and you know this, we all know this, to be our own worst critics <sighs> and to go, I didn't, yeah. I didn't earn that. I didn't earn that moment back Oof. there. I didn't earn that. The show I'm doing right now, uh, Romeo and Juliet, everybody knows what that's about. Um, mm-hmm. Lord Montague, Romeo's dad, never has a scene with him. Just yeah. talks, just talks <laughs> to Benvolio about how he's such an emo guy and he's so sad i don't know why what, he's, he's a teenager he's like he right. won't talk to me i can't i can't figure out what's going on and that's at the beginning of the play that's the very first scene and then the very last scene when both of these teenagers are dead in this crypt and everybody's crying and the houses are there and the prince is like look what happened yeah. <laughs> uh, his wife's dead he comes on stage saying my wife's dead because she died of grief when you banished our son and the prince and he's like what else happened <laughs> what 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 did I miss? And the prince is like, uh, take a look. And in very little time, uh, this character has to, you know, mourn his son's death right on the heels of just losing his wife. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a it's a little you know on the page. It doesn't take up a lot of space. You don't see this character a lot throughout the show. He kind of comes in and out. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's not like the Capulets. We see a lot of the Capulets, which is right. awesome. But there's a lot to do in that very little time. And it's easy for me to beat myself up and go, this has to be good. We have to, we have to believe that this father figure just lost his wife. And now he just lost his only son. And some nights the tears are there and some nights they're not. Some nights sure. I'm, I'm just exhausted. And, but as long as I'm connecting with something then I feel like I've done my job, but I will never know unless I'm an audience member, if I'm, if I'm actually achieving what I want to achieve. Right. And that goes with any, with all roles, I guess. I love diving into that part of it. Cause like you said, we can become our own worst critics. And there is this kind of illusion of like, this is the only right way to do something. And it's like checking a box where it is so ethereal, the experience of the art and the role. And yeah, it's wild. Which also ties into, I feel professional auditions in a sense because you just you just said that and it reminded me of like I'm I'm wary now at this point in my life in my career of taking black and white it must be like this advice from people in the industry yeah 
I was told for a number of years by at least a couple of different people, never wear all black in an audition. Never wear all black. Oh. My part on the newsroom was for a bartender. Right. So I wore all, all black, black. Yeah. Because that's what they wear. And I got it. Yeah, you did. So there are rules that folks, whether it's good intentioned or otherwise, folks in the business, folks that have been in the business for 50 plus years, mm -hmm. that, you know, it's it's fascinating to, as performers, go, that works for me. And I yeah. don't necessarily think that will, this other thing will work for me. I'll sh I should try it in an audition. That's the other thing. Every audition for every casting person is completely different because yeah. they're going to want something. Uh huh. And nine times out of 10, especially in video games, it's what the client wants. The casting director will go, well, Brian Balance is perfect for this part. And they come in and casting's like, oh, we want somebody yeah. with, <laughs> with black hair right. and, no, and no beard. Well, we can dye it and he can shape. No, no. Next. Like it. Isn't that wild? There's it's no like rhyme or reason. So out of your of hands. <laughs> if he was just two inches taller. Oh, well, this person's two inches taller. Right. They're, they're you know, and uh, once we remind ourselves of that, it's easier mm -hmm. to not be critics of ourselves. Hopefully it's, it's less, you know. Yeah. Every, every audition is an opportunity to play. That's right. And if you if you have no expectations going in there, just get to be your lovely self and say the words and have something fun planned afterwards. That's good advice from a good friend of mine. Make sure you have something fun to do after the audition. Oh, I like that. That's good. Because then then you're not putting everything on the audition. Then you're like, I can't wait to go, you know, do an escape room with my friends right. after this or whatever it is. That's good. Even if it's go home and play video games, like whatever makes you happy, have something fun or a meal or something afterwards. Cause yeah, it's a little nugget in there in the midst of all this. I like that. Good. I, Stephen O. Young gave me one, one of the best pieces of advice I've ever heard about dealing with nerves when doing a, when doing a job. Mm. And he said that, cause I was like, oh, don't you get nervous? And he's like, yeah, but the thing is, if you're nervous, you're judging yourself and you're not doing the work. He mm. said, get so involved in focusing on the work yeah. to where you don't have time to get nervous because do the work. And yeah. you're doing a disservice to the character by being nervous because you're not in it. And I was like, ooh. For sure. Writing that down. Yeah. And now I have two. One from him, one from you. <laughs> and that and that energy, that's great. He said that because that energy is real. That's that's another thing. I We talked, I think, outside of this. Mm -hmm. G Gordon Hunt. I, yeah. I had his class for a bit. And we can, I have his book right here. The How to Audition. I have it as well. Um, yeah. I was, I was, uh, he was nice enough to sign it before um, he, yep, there it is. Um, great book. Yeah. He, he always, uh, he talked about nerves mm -hmm. and he might have it actually in that book. Um, he talks about recognizing it and talking to it. Yeah. You know, if, you, if, you, if you're, if you're in the restroom in the building before you, you know, you got 15 minutes for your audition, you've signed in and you're like, Ooh, I'm feeling nervous. And you just kind of excuse yourself, go outside, go to the bathroom, whatever. And it's like, and then you find it physically in your body. Where am I nervous? Yeah. It's, it's like, for me, it's like, it's says chest or stomach. And then you just kind of find it and you talk to it. You go, yeah. hey, how you doing? <laughs> thanks for, thanks for showing up today. Yeah. Hey, pal. Think, uh, how about, how about uh, welcome? You welcome it. And you, there go, you go, this is, this is something that's here. It's happening. What can we do together? to make this a great time. Yeah. Uh, and I found that extremely helpful, which I feel is kind of similar yep. to what Steven was saying. It's the same idea, which I love, uh, which makes perfect sense for his audition as Mr. Negative. Now yeah. he's thinking back on it because <laughs> he had this energy and I was yeah. just like, Whoa. it wasn't negative, <laughs> right? Uh, but it was very, it was very positively charged energy. And he just, he owned the room and I'm sure he was nervous, Yep, but you couldn't tell because he owned it. He yeah. just, he was a cocky as hell. Yeah. <laughs> um, but a, but a pleasure to read with. I was, I was his reader for that. Yeah. Were, yeah. were you nervous doing newsroom then? Cause it's a great show. Been going for a bit. It's Aaron Sorkin. Yes. Yes, I was. Uh, I hadn't, I'd started watching it. Like I'd seen that famous first episode with that yeah. brilliant first scene. <laughs> Right. Yeah. You, you asked me why America is the number one country in the uh -huh. world. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. This, like that this, whole this, thing this. is amazing. And then Jeff Daniels falling in love with him again. Yep. 
I don't yep. know if I ever fell out of love with that with that man as an actor, but Nobody but yeah, that, uh, I knew what it was and recognizing it, and then getting lucky enough to to get that audition and and book it. Um, I was nervous, but at the same time, this is interesting. This uh-huh. this actually I didn't realize this until now. That's what I'm here for. I had something fun planned after the shoot day. Hey, hey. They were doing a four film marathon of all the evil deads. Cause the first, the, the, the most recent remake mm-hmm. that doesn't have Bruce Campbell, but the really kind of gory gritty remake uh-huh. that had a dog in it unnecessarily. Yeah. <laughs> um, that had just come out. So yeah, 2013 that had just come out. So they were showing OG one evil dead two Dude. and then army of darkness. And then at midnight they were premiering. And, and this was all in Westwood and the shoot ran late. So uh, I, and I was downtown and uh, I'd left my car in Culver, took the bus early morning to get downtown to Pershing square. They were shooting like two blocks up in, in one of the hotels in the hotel lobby uh, scene there uh-huh. had a great shoot day, learned so much about uh, more about on camera and met Aaron Sorkin, who's the nicest oh, cool. guy, very tall, super nice. Um, the other castmates, very, very awesome people could tell they were doing something special. Sure. Giant, giant three, four foot long HD, 4K, 8K cameras, whatever they had. Cool. Um, that I guess HBO owns and nobody else can, can rent. <laughs> like they're that power move just, yeah so like the so the monitor looked like the finished product with like color correction and everything oh wow so so the director could actually see how the shot would look on tv that's cool stuff like that it's just blowing my mind and but yeah it was an all-day thing and it ran late and uh, i couldn't get i couldn't get a lift out of downtown because the subway shut down randomly oh, no. <laughs> like the metro was like ah you can't yeah. so i needed to get so then i had to like walk downtown to like a place where a cab would pick me up it was a whole thing but they, i didn't i didn't get to the evil dead marathon until like 11 30 and then i finally saw Ooh. the new movie i missed the original three my <laughs> friends were there and they're like oh you missed the ones well, i've seen them but i hadn't like seen them on the big screen you know i've never seen i i think i was more it's i'm trying to answer your question of like were you nervous i was like the whole time i was like I might be missing some of the evil dead marathon so it was actually nice to have that <laughs> because it's it's probably on number two as i say that i'm like yeah i'm like (laughs) as i say that i'm like that's not that weren't you weren't you thrilled and 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 excited to be there and like what a privilege to get to work on that absolutely yeah but if that's all i had to focus on i wouldn't have been able to do my job if i had been like look at these giant cameras oh my god Aaron's working so tall oh my god there's allison pill i hope i i hope i remember my line like i would have just spiraled sure it, and and I was very happy to be, I could have missed all four of the movies. Right. I was staying there and, and having the thing. I do remember at one point because, you know, theater kid, uh-huh. I found that the AD or the, the production assistant on the set. And I was like, Hey, I, I went up to them. I was like, Hey, I, uh, I need to use the restroom. Is it all right? If I leave this, uh-huh. kind of, you know, cause the, the actors are kind of over here when we need you, when yep. the, set, the shots lit and set up. And then I had this look of like, yeah, it's right there. Thank you. Thank you for letting me like no one ever tells <laughs> right. production says, or, or production. Hey, an actor is going to. So, you know, when they turn around and they're not, there's like, I don't know where they went. Just the communication. And I was like, yeah, of course. Uh-huh. Why wouldn't I tell you where I'm going? <laughs> that stuck out in my head. I, I like to think that you used it because I've seen that episode and I've seen you in it. And you're like, all right, we're leaving. You grab Alice and, and leave the scene. So. <laughs> subconsciously you're like i got a movie to catch so weird <laughs> yeah i was at, i when we had um again it's the only time i've been on tv thus far knock on wood it's a good one um it's a great one um but you know it's been so long now uh-huh. been casting people <laughs> why haven't you done anything since that well i've been doing motion capture yeah. and voiceover <laughs> oh that's not the same no it's not it's it's still acting and i still yeah. got paid for it i don't know what you're anyway this is me assuming right. this is what the general uh populace in the industry is like um i don't think it's far from the truth yeah i agree with you but um <laughs> how many takes did you get yeah well it, sorkin wasn't directing he was just he was okay. literally like he literally had to leave in the morning to go write the rest of the season cool. like the guy, i i don't know how he <laughs> does it but yeah genius. um but we had a really great director julian farino uh, i remember his name because again i've only had one tv gig so sure it's to remember names 
super nice uh i believe british uh, director and um <laughs> we had to do a couple extra takes because again i was the bartender and waltz never bartended before he's waited he's been ah. a waiter in a restaurant got it he's never bartended so you know actor being terrible uh-huh so they they'd give me the you know the drink with the fake ice and everything in it and uh i would bring it over uh to to miss pill like this ah. with my fingers <laughs> on the mouth listeners at home the, the, yeah <laughs> my fingers just gripping the top of the glass like a frat boy uh, at a party the old dixie terrible cup. <laughs> yeah the dixie cup grab exactly <laughs> as opposed to like hey here's your you know just right how how a bartender sh- and this is before covid right. um <laughs> so i there's there's one of those where it's just like you'd come over and be like oh, that's, that's a good take you just want to make sure that when you when you bring the the glass over you're not you're not touching the rims I go, <laughs> oh and it's something i didn't even sure so for the rest of that it's it's you know right. very very dainty. bad act of this, of this bartender <laughs> just daintily but i'm pretty sure they kept one of the takes of me just manhandling it I, if we go back i think you just see Devin just there you go so eh. whatever it's my first day. So it wasn't a bunch of takes. It was, I was trying to make sure they weren't doing more takes because of me messing up. Smart man. It's interesting when you're a, when you're a, what are they, they don't call it guest star, co-star, you know, you're, you're, when you're on there for a day to just be a bit mm-hmm. part. Day player. You have a day player and you have mm-hmm. the, you have the regular cast. Yeah. Very rarely is the cast having to do multiple takes because they're messing up. You don't want to be the cause of them staying late because you don't get it. So there was that pressure. Sure. And whenever that would creep in, I would just go, God, I hope I see Evil Dead tonight. You're right. <laughs> um, hope the glass, yeah, I'd change it. But also, uh, yeah. it's probably on movie three by now. Okay. <laughs> Overall, wonderful production, wonderful people, crew behind and in front of the camera. Um, all the extras that were in the scene, I tried to, you know, in between takes, it was just talking to people. Be like, hey, sure. How you, doing? you know, try to be, you know, to help the time go. Mm-hmm. But a really good experience for my one and only. Hey, so it's not bad. It's not no, bad. No, it's not. I'm very thankful for it. How shortly after or around this time did you start at Sony? Yeah, so a little bit before that, Gordon Hunt was doing a motion capture workshop at House of Moves. It was like Ooh. an eight-hour all-Saturday thing. Uh, this Dude. was between Uncharted 2 and Uncharted 3, I think. And it was a motion capture workshop. I was dating a young woman at the time who was his personal assistant. Nice. Who had also gone to UCLA. And um, I said, oh, that sounds like fun. Changed my fucking life. <laughs> <laughs> it was Gordon Hunt and Amy Hennig. Oh, uh, amazing. Creator of the Uncharted series. Mm-hmm. Um, and they had worked closely together on the first two games. And I guess three was about to come out. Um, but they had Graham McTavish there. Now Dude. Outlander and Hobbit fame. And uh-huh. he, was, he was Cutter and in, uh, in three, and they had Claudia Black there, Dude. Um, which was a big deal for me because I had been watching Farscape with my dad you know, when, when that first came out. It's like, Ooh, Jim Henson Company has a new show, and she was one of the few humans in it. Mm-hmm. Um, they were all humans. <laughs> um, no, they weren't, Walt. No, they weren't. Um, <laughs> And I, I remember during the workshop, because there's only like a handful of students, there's only like 20 students or something, which was cool. And the whole the whole point of the, the workshop was to just show how motion capture works, how you perform in motion capture. And my cool. mind was blown. Yeah. And uh, how the suit works, how the, how, the, how the data gets tracked, everything else. Um, and yeah, at one point I was just like, oh, Claudia Black loved you in Farscape. And she's like, God, somebody saw that? You know, <laughs> kind of the, her reaction to that. It was me. <laughs> Little did I know that years later, I would be in a mocap suit opposite her for Lost Legacy for little bit parts. There's like a, at the beginning of the game, I think she's like undercover and trying to get into a checkpoint. And uh, I didn't voice the characters, but I, you know, I was in a suit and we had to act that she shows her ID and I let Mm -hmm. her through. And so I'm just, again, talking to you. I'm thinking of these moments where it's like, yeah, oh, that's cool. Isn't that neat? um yeah and uh she's such a wonderful they're all most of the people that i'm going to name drop is because i'm name dropping them because they're wonderful human beings and Mm -hmm. i've either become friends with them or i've i've learned from these people yeah not just how to act but also how to act as a human being sure and the voiceover and mocap community it's very 
because it's so loving and so uh -huh. again you've talked with so many folks uh, in the industry in general but but also in, in voiceover and mocap it's so loving it's so everyone's just just boosting each other up and yeah. congratulating each other and it's amazing how little competition there's still competition sure how how considerably less there is compared to film and tv oh that's a fact <laughs> when you take yeah. the looks out maybe i don't know what it yeah. is film and tv is cutthroat but just the people that that you know like I, jb touched on this yeah in your episode which i loved listening to um, thank you I just love listening to him in general. His voice Agreed. is so soothing. It is. Um, when he's not calling me a cunt. Yeah. Um, it's, I, I lied. It's still very soothing when, right. when he does that. I'm, I'm kind of okay with it. Oh, it's great. <laughs> it makes you feel loved. He's the um, best. He is. Uh, and again, uh, years of... So a lot of these folks that I, I met through working at Sony, so I'll, I'll backtrack again real quick, mm -hmm. did this eight hour intensive mocap day and had lunch with the actors and just asked like, you know, how is this experience for you and everything. And then at the end of it, we got to act out scenes from Uncharted 2. Oh. And um, one of the scenes that I, that they picked up and gave me was Drake and Elena kind of driving to, to catch the train. And he's mm -hmm. like on the edge of the, the thing. And then he has to jump onto the train and um, I just committed to it and did it and had fun. Yeah. And um, after that, Gordon Hunt invited me to join his acting workshop. And uh, I did. And that was also transformative and learned a lot and um, got to hone my skills outside of, you know, sure. UCLA. Like I don't have the safety net anymore. And I get to work with older more experienced actors that have been doing this for years yeah. and from them. And, and then again, the wisdom that, that was Gordon and did that for a number of years. And then they had a second workshop, mocap workshop at Culver studios when Sony was renting out stage two at Culver and they were shooting, they were starting to shoot some of their games there. Mm -hmm. And when I went to that second one uh, and this time it was scenes from three, very similar kind of same stuff. Uh, Bill Beamer, who was, um, running the stage at the time said i'm hiring production assistants so if you guys want to apply please do and i immediately i jumped yeah. on the chance i said get in there pa on a stage and i did i was lucky enough my friend scott uh carlisle who i i knew from ucla and also friends big friends group he was already working with them and i'm pretty sure he put in a good word for me thank you scott I'll nice thank him until the end of days um love that guy and he's he's been uh he was also in a suit with me in Lost Legacy together. Great. Um, so just throughout the years, we've gotten to work together. And then he was in Gordon Hunt's workshop with me, and we got to act together. So after that second uh, workshop, which was also wonderful, Nolan North was there. Uh, oh, he was, legend. He, he had his book uh, on Uncharted 3 and the shooting of it there, and he signed it. And cool. Gave out copies. Super nice guy. Um, and then, yeah, that's how I got that job. And one of my first days on a cinematic shoot day was um the opening scene in the first last of us it's what joel coming With home his daughter? On, the, on the phone and sarah's asleep on the couch and she kind of wakes up and he oh. you know scoot scoot over and just kind of come down and and they had that scene and that was i i knew i knew there was acting in yeah. motion capture obviously i was familiar with i was learning more and more about everything they did for the uncharted games and how yeah. grounded they were and that you know it's one of the reasons they work so well and this was the first time where i'm just like this is gonna be a video game and it's just a father daughter sitting on the couch talking and we've had scenes before you know but there's something about that shoot i was just like this is this is yeah. special this is unique but i had started halfway through the game so okay. I knew nothing about it. <laughs> I knew I knew there was some infected, not zombies, infected. I knew there were uh -huh. some spores. I knew there was a thing going on. And then, yeah, we I helped shoot the last half of all the mocap for that and uh, made some friends during that process and got to know some of the Naughty Dog animators. And I'm still good friends with, with some of them today. And, uh, cool. Uh, and then, you know, from there, we were doing auditions in that space for God of War, for Days mm -hmm. Gone, started shooting Days Gone in that space. And then eventually they, I think in 20, end of 2014, end of 2015, Sony got their own space in Playa Vista and they're now known as the Sony Stages. Oh, uh, okay. 
And so I helped kind of with that transition and like running cable and try to set up the two, the two mocap cage uh, cages in um, Playa Vista because Culver Studios is now gone. Amazon sure. took it out. Now they have a big thing there. So how'd you like it? Because it's it's different. A PA uh, like there's a lot of technical responsibility. A lot of technical responsibility. And back at Culver, we didn't have uh, a kitchen. We had like a green room with a little with a little you know place, a crafty for snacks table, and stuff. Yeah, crafty table, mm-hmm. and a little and a little refrigerator. But every time we had a shoot, myself and the other PA, whoever it was that day, had to load up um, uh, coolers on wheels with with gotcha. uh, ice. And so every day we had a shoot day, we had to load up the coolers, put put you know, I don't know if we had Lacroix back then. We were about to have Lacroix back then. You know, sparkling waters, waters, sodas, anything and everything, juices, uh, Starbucks coffee, double shot. Things, oh yeah. You know, people would go crazy with those. Uh, so it was a very different, uh, there's a lot more work <laughs> to be done. <laughs> and then you get actors in suits, you get coffee for the director or tea for the director. There was a uh, cafeteria in the, mm-hmm. at the studio lot. So you'd go get specialty items for people. And that's where we'd have lunches and stuff like that. So it was cool. The early days were cool, but it was always much more physical work, building sets. That's never gone away. Sure really intense stuff and then so yeah once we got to playa vista and we had our own space each stage has their own space and each one has their own kitchenette with a full oh know, there there is a closet there's a utility closet between the two stages at the current space where it has all the snacks and that's cool. where you restock crafty for the day and um there is a legit coffee espresso latte machine so if a Ooh. director or an actor does want can i get like a you know triple shot at something blah 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 you can kind of do it i'm not a barista but you can kind of throw something together and like mm, yeah that's good or no this is terrible yeah <laughs> um, and i know eventually they put in a nitro um like a nitro coffee spout in the back Oof. um so once actors found out about that it's game over <laughs> um, got more scenes done though because they were like yeah yeah let's go let's go yeah. sure <laughs> Just Dave Grohl when he used to be, you know, coffee uh-huh. crazy. It's like, yeah, fresh pot. That's that'll work. That'll work. That's exactly what the actors turned into. That's awesome. Yeah. How cool must that have been, though? It was amazing. It was awesome. And like from an acting standpoint, because you're getting to see all these crazy performances, like how are you not soaking that up? It is very beneficial. And I've said this to a lot of uh, people that reach out for coaching or reach out for workshops or whatever and, and want to know like, oh, I... I want to, I want to get on a mocap stage so bad. I want to act in the game. I want to, I want to do voiceover. How did you do it? And I go, well, you have to be lazy and yep. uh, not know. No, it's terrible. And listen advice. to the interesting podcast. What I, <laughs> yeah, listen, listen to the interesting podcast. Right. Um, do what Kieran Shaw did back in yeah, the seventies. Exactly. Get on Superman. Um, no. Service I provide. <laughs> I love it. I, I usually say, allow yourself to have time. Ooh. so that you can offer yourself willingly as a production assistant or something mm-hmm. in the making of what you want to be a part of. Smart. Because that is an education that you're getting paid for. Sure. You learn so much about that medium. If you're, if you're a PA on a, on a TV show, you are learning mm-hmm. so much about yeah. all of it. No different than being on a mocap stage. It's still a shoot. It's still a professional shoot. Mm-hmm. And when you're a PA, you are, yes, you're getting coffee and waters for people, but you are also suiting people up. You are uh, getting this actor to the uh, ROM, range of motion, mm-hmm. uh, stage in the back so they can put their their movement into the computer. Then you're getting them to makeup so that they can do all the dots if makeup's needed. Get mm-hmm. them to the HMCs, head mounted cameras so they can have the HMCs on. So there's so many responsibilities and then you're building sets and then everything's in meters as well, which is oh. interesting and actually helpful. Um, now I know exactly how high two meters is. Like yeah. meters <laughs> are just like, I know how high that is. And then after doing so many shoots, when the client's like, okay, we need this little stunt. We need to jump over this thing and then they crash into a door or whatever. Sure. Okay, we can do, you know, remember what we did for Lost Legacy? Let's put something up like that here for T2, for Last of Us Part Two, and we'll, and we'll see, you know, we'll get the dimensions right. So it becomes 
easier, uh, not always quicker, but easier to put together whatever the the set is. Same with Spider Man. Like Spider Man was was a big set heavy type of deal. Yeah, a lot of flipping off of stuff, swinging. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of stunts, but uh, amazing team overall. That's the other thing about Sony. I've been very spoiled. Uh, Sony, <laughs> now Interactive Entertainment, S-I-E-A, Sony Interactive Entertainment America. The motion capture crew for those two stages in Playa Vista mm-hmm. is one of the best in the business, hands down. Yeah. It's why the stage is as expensive as it is to rent. Sure. You get the best possible, you get the best data, you get the best everything. I'm biased. So, yeah. you know, people, people that work at Rouge and House of Moves that hear this, just like that fucking guy. Right. I'm, I'm biased, but I'm also, I've worked on those other stages as a performer or as a, uh, a helper with a camera crew or whatever. And I, I do notice a difference. And I'm also, I'm saying this after hearing a bunch of my friends work in all these different stages. Sure. Sony, Sony is, uh, is a haven. It is a blessing. Yeah, to work to work there and to shoot there doesn't mean it always goes smoothly. It doesn't mean that they always get all the shots done that they want. But as far as professionalism and feeling safe and feeling welcome, I was very very fortunate to to find my way into Sony mocap and work there for eight ish years. That's cool. How long did you work as a PA before you decide to jump in front of it? <laughs> My decision has nothing to do with that, unfortunately. <laughs> if it was up to me, it would have been week two. Sure. <laughs> um, I only had a manager at the time. I didn't. I didn't have a voiceover agent until only a, a little while after that. Um, mm-hmm. it, it, that. That's that's the thing, right? If you're if you're going to be a production assistant on a shoot, you need to be the production assistant on that shoot. That is right. where you're going to do the most help, and you're going to be the best asset to what needs to be done. Mm-hmm. If you are an actor playing the part of the production assistant so you can Mm -hmm. tell everybody how good of an actor you are or tell them, yeah, I can get into a suit. You guys need me to get into a suit? Sure. If you need. I mean, I did that. That stuff, much like a nervous audition, comes across immediately. And the clients kind of go, right. You have to focus on the job at hand and what you're there to do. Mm-hmm. in order to do it well. I did not always do that well. Sure. I would very not so subtly tug on the proverbial uh, sleeve of somebody and say, hey, you know, if you guys ever need a reader for auditions, um, you know, I'm, I'm available. And uh, it's a lot of fun. But, you, you know, it's, it's a fine line. And it right. really depends. It depends on one's, I think it depends on one's personality. You can still be driven. Mm-hmm. You can still have the drive. You're like, I will act on this stage someday. Yeah. But you also have to have the patience. You have to be in the right place at the right time. You've talked about this before. Preparation uh, meets opportunity. Mm-hmm. Uh, Troy Baker likes saying patience and persistence. All these things. If you are focusing on the job at hand for that shoot and doing that to the best of your ability, that is what people remember. And if you if you are you know not a jerk about it, right? Uh, people, I like Walt. I want to work with Walt again. Hopefully, is the idea in any capacity. And then if if and when they get to find out he has an MFA in acting, he's an actor. Uh, maybe we should maybe we should you know try him out. We love Yuri, but. If we don't have to pay Yuri to read right. <laughs> for these auditions, and they do obviously bring in Yuri for late for like callbacks and stuff to do of course. chemistry auditions, but for mm-hmm. for the better part of a year, I, I was lucky enough to be the reader for Insomniac's first Spider Man. Wow! And I read, I read as Peter, I read as Osborne, I read as uh, Miles, like fifteen year old Miles just lost his dad. So like they they were yeah. I was lucky that they were able to see like a whole range from me, which n- never happens. Smart man. Okay, I had very little to do with it. I was just in the right place, offer my services up mm. and ready to ready to play and have fun. You have to have fun. Yeah. But also being on that side of auditions, again, more education. You I learn bet. so, so much. The Mr. Negative Day was a great learning experience for me as an actor. <laughs> I was the line, it was a it was a bank. I don't think this is in the game. It might be, but there was a bank hold up and Mr. Negative is just kind of, you know, the demon uh, force his his guys are yep running around doing bad things and he's saying lines to them and then there's this guy on his knees on the floor tied hands tied behind his back please man please i have a family at home and i just want i just want to be able to see my daughter again. whatever it was you know sure for his life and then mr negative says something cool and kills him right 
It's like, well, I guess you're going to be late for dinner, whatever he says. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's the same. It's not very long, but it's basically just to see him in, in a suit in control, be this badass Marvel villain. Yeah. And uh, we already know Steve killed it and he got the job, but there was another actor that came in. I don't remember who it was. And I, if I did, I would never say his name. Right. Unless it was <laughs> helpful to him. Of course. Came in with a ballad song, Butterfly Knife. Huh. <laughs> Didn't tell anybody. Oh, no. Didn't say, hey, guys, I'm just letting you know I have a prop here. It's dulled. There's no way I can hurt anybody. <laughs> so we're doing the scene, and I see him talking and because he just wanted to show off this skill, right? Quick little flippy. And so he does it, and I hear the table behind me of the director, the creative director, head animator, writer. I just hear collective... <sighs> Of just the air going out of the room, oh, no. everybody's everybody's buttholes puckering because this yeah. guy just pulled out a knife in, in in Los Angeles an illegal weapon. Yeah, a ballot song is considered a concealed weapon. Good God! And I'm on my knees, <laughs> <laughs> about to get stabbed, quote unquote, right uh, by this guy for this audition. And I remember thinking, well. <sighs> Sony will take care of me, right? <laughs> How does this work? If I've been hired to be, so I'm like playing this in my head. Now I'm sweating for real sure. watching this guy. I'm like, and to his credit, he was off, you know, he was in front of me. So, so the people behind me just saw me getting stabbed uh -huh. because they just see my back. So right. he's not, you know, but he is, you know, maybe a good this far away from me. Just tut, 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 tut. And I, and I acted and finished it. But when you see a, knife come out during an audition and yeah. nobody told you about it <laughs> no. so that's just a nice that's a nice uh thing for all performers to to know don't don't come into an audition yeah with an, with an unannounced <laughs> weapon no matter how much you think it's going to help your if you're at home taping something and you have especially if you can tell it's fake if you have a orange tip gun uh -huh. or something yeah and it helps your scene sure I mean, a lot of, that's another thing. A lot of casting people say, don't use props. You know, there's no right way with that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of play. Like if you can make the place clear, if you're in a library and you have a, and you have a bookshelf in your living room, use it. Yeah. That's what I say. Why not? A lot of people don't agree with me on that, I, I guess, but I don't, I think the less work the casting director and then really the client by extension has to do mm -hmm. when they see you, I think is a good thing. But anyway, that story I agree with just that. popped into mind because of, of, of Steve. That's wild. I mean, that then you're really in it, huh? When you've got a knife in front of you. <laughs> and again, the guy was safe, and but but you know they sure. left, and everybody was just like, "What the hell?" Like, right. you just, they're like, "Walter, are you okay?" And I'm like, "I'm fine." That was kind of crazy. I haven't right. experienced that. Did we just witness a crime? <laughs> yes, and no. Right. But it's not because because then the case in point. Then the people auditioning you, they're not paying attention to your acting. Everything is going to that blade. And right. going, are we about to have an accident here? Do we need to call Lee? Like, sure. You're not paying attention to what you're doing at all. Good point. So don't don't bring in props that will distract from your mm. work. Smart. Because it will affect your chances of getting the role big time. It's like a whole different way to say that you paid your dues as a PA to a reader with an actual knife. And then yeah, sure. <laughs> you know. I guess this is it. Yeah. At least They'll I got a funeral on costs. <laughs> um, Yeah, no, but so, so through that, and then I think just word of mouth and, um, you know, some friends go into casting and, and uh, again, right place, right time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and other people on stage are like, well, Walt, Walt can read this line during the shot or whatever. I would still audition for parts for games we were shooting. But I at least knew I knew what the, um, you know, having worked on the stage, I knew what the the fake name was, the, the cover sure, name. Code name. So I could go, oh, I know exactly what this is. Right. I, OK, I know the world. I can kind of do that. So that's that's how I ended up getting um, Spider-Man. I think they were just they were nice enough to invite me to play. Oh, we need to play this old man in the feast thing, smacking the TV. Uh -huh. And we need some bit things here and there. Great. Thank you so much. Amazing of opportunity. Course. Great time. And then later for like Last of Us Part Two. That was that yeah. was aud auditioning for that and getting those bits. So it has been a it, you know thinking back on it, it's it's a mesh. I couldn't tell you exactly how things happened where, but I it wasn't always handed to me. It was either audition or in in the case of the Avengers, mm -hmm. they hadn't they hadn't cast Taskmaster yet. So I I was there already in a suit to just be an extra body and helpful. And so I I stood in. I learned the quick two little lines when oh cool when Romanoff takes him out and then. Uh, 
I think it was Travis William that was just like, well, let's just have Walt do it. And there you um, go. Bless you, Travis. Um, but yeah, so that's cool. Things happen in different again. If you're in the right place at the right time, make yourself available. Don't push it. Right. Try not to push it. And I have pushed it before. Of and course. You can tell you can feel. I'll be talking <laughs> to a casting person and they'll say something super sweet where it's like, you know, oh, it's great to see you. And I'll be like, Yeah, I don't know when I'll be here again. Yeah, you know, <laughs> shit comes out of my mouth. Right. And I can hear their disappointments and just like uh, okay i'm just like fuck fuck you hear the jaw clinch a little bit oh no yeah that's definitely happened <laughs> and i'm hopefully now with the pandemic of being stuck at home for a while i i'd like to think i'm much more aware of that and i don't jump on these opportunities to go hey guys i'm available i'm free right, yeah. don't you need me anymore right. when are you gonna write me in something pal like, oh no oh, oh. <laughs> those are the worst no 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 <laughs> Because there is a, there's a very, it's a weird dichotomy. I don't know if dichotomy is the right word. There's, there's the idea of like folks do need to be reminded that you're yes. available and you work, which is weird because you could work with somebody for a year and kill mm -hmm. it. Once they're on another project, you don't know what their lives are like. They're busy trying to make this game. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Why don't we bring so-and-so in for this? Oh, Brian's amazing. Why don't we bring, like sometimes folks just need reminding, but the other part of that is like, you can't remind them. Right. Yeah, no. <laughs> you can, but then right. you're like, oh, he's, he's needy. It's, right. oh, that was awkward. No, weird... don't, don't call him out. I don't want to hang out with him anymore. <laughs> right. That weird game of hide and seek. Yeah. All of that, uh, that, that, and then I think it's another reason I don't have a theatrical agent right now. My manager dropped me uh, years Who ago. Needs him? Um, <laughs> I, I do um no well, we they, don't they, well at a principle after, <laughs> after newsroom when i wasn't booking you know heart of dixie and everything else that i was going <laughs> sure. out for immediately i was kind of told they were like well why don't you join second city or ucb and mm, and of course and pay pay those people with your time and your money mm -hmm. that you don't have uh and then when you have your showcases we can invite you know casting directors to it mm. and that's how we'll get you on shows and i went i can't do yeah. that i don't have the time like there's something also about three years of grad school and yeah. still <laughs> being in student debt for that sure like, can, you, can you do some more schooling and do some improv please i can hold my own there, there have been there have been shoots where it's me and two other people in mocap suits and we're asked to improv scenes to just make wow. it look natural yeah. i can do that all day and have a blast with it great won't necessarily be funny because right. <laughs> I can, you know, yes. And yes, sure. But uh -huh. so I don't, I don't have official improv training. I, sure. I do want to get into that at some point. I've had some very talented friends go through the gamuts of those, those programs and they're very fun shows to see. Um, but I know it's so much work Yeah, and I, and I have huge respect for those that do improv and I have huge respect for those that do stand up. I think it's the hardest form of entertainment ever. I totally agree. Room full of people. Okay, dude, make us laugh. Yeah, which is relative because not yes. everyone finds the same things funny. Yup. Well, no and that's thanks. that's reading that's reading your audience too. That's a that's a great thing for an actor and a PA on a set. Read your audience. Read the room. That's one of the biggest th things that you learn working on a shoot. And if you are an actor, sometimes it's not hurtful, but it's a, if, if you're watching a performance and you're kind of going, interesting. Okay, I see. I kind of see what the actor's doing. And then you see the director give them a note or you give them a direction uh -huh. and Walt, the actor goes, okay, I think I know what I would do with that. And then the actor does something completely different. Uh huh. And then you see the director after the next take go, uh, yeah, that's kind of what, but they, they're just not. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes, not always. Sometimes sure. it's very easy. And sometimes it's an animator that wants to give uh, uh, to, through the director. An animator is a director and they don't have a lot of directing experience. Communication has been the biggest Ooh. thing I've learned about on a stage. And it's one of the reasons I, I started trying to get into directing uh, once the pandemic hit. I've been able to direct from home, but I've, I've been on a number of shoots where the communication was great. For example, with Insomniac, like mm -hmm. there's a whole team of incredibly talented storytellers and animators that are also directing. And right. there's a cinematic director. So there's a lot of cooks, but in their case, it works. I don't know how they do it, but they do it very well. And I've, I've, I've been there while they've done it. So like, I'm just saying like, it's, it's very difficult what they do, but they excel at it. They found their way to do it. And it's awesome. They got their team meshed. They have their team meshed. Yeah. Yeah. And, but then there's other shoots <laughs> where three different people from three different Ugh. backgrounds, here's an animator, here's a director, here's, you know, uh, creative design. I, I don't know who, uh, telling, telling actor 
three different things. And then you see the actor go, Ugh. I'm so sorry. Hopefully they're, they're raising their hand and going, I'm so sorry. I was just told three different things. I've also seen communication shut down a shoot day. We would have 10 shots we need to get done, five in the morning, five in the afternoon. And we are on shot two. And we have been on shot two since Ugh. 11 a.m. And it is now 3.30. Oh, so no. stuff like that happens. And as someone just, again, just working on the stage. I put them in the suit. I built the set and we're wait I'm ready to hit the clapper. We're ready to do this. Mm -hmm. Just watching the interaction of this poor performer. Sometimes Ooh. it's not the perform not sometimes sure. <laughs> the performer is not the poor person, but usually it's the director. The director doesn't know. Right. Or will ask questions like, How big is this? Mm -hmm. And the team, the client just doesn't know. They haven't built it yet. And that's sure. just that happens a lot where we're trying to shoot something, but not all the design has been finished. That gets very frustrating for the performers and for the directors. Like, well, how can we make this specific? Right. But it's those instances where hopefully someday, if I am trusted with a project, I can direct or, or be part of the ease of that communication because time is still very much money. Mm -hmm. You want to make the animators happy. You want to make the clients happy. You want to make, depending on the performer, the performer yeah. <laughs> feel like they're doing well because there are different levels of, of uh, people that come through to, to shoot stuff for sure. Definitely. But it's, it's so important to have a clear understanding of the project at hand. Uh, that's something Naughty Dog is very good at. There is a distinct hierarchy of communication. Uh, they take the time to rehearse the scenes ahead of the shoot. We know exactly what we're doing when. If someone has a note for a performer, as far as the physical something in a scene, not the acting, but a physical something, right? They, they then tell Neil, they tell the director. And so then Neil can share it as opposed to someone just coming up and saying, hey, make sure you jiggle the door this way. Right. So there's the very clear hierarchy, which I think helps. I agree. It's a much more subdued tone as well, because, you know, their games are dark as hell. <laughs> um, but very, I mean, you see the end product. It's... Oh, God. Some of the best storytelling, period, in any medium. Absolutely. Was it cool to go from like your first gig as a PA was the first Last of Us and then getting to actually like be an actor in the second? Yeah. Yeah, I had to have been. That was, that was really... That was really there. There was um, the the few days. It was only one or two days. I think I was in a suit, but it was those days of like, okay, Abby gets in line to get the burrito. I'm gonna be this guy that kind of steps back or comment. You know, we're either chasing audio that someone already recorded, and it's just kind of like, yeah, sure, whatever, go ahead. Sure. Just just those little moments, or uh, Mel Ashley Birch getting off the truck when she's been injured, and then that that guy, that random guy that comes out to get her and take her to the ER. Uh -huh. That's that's me in a suit. Just knowing that being there and watching all these other amazing actors work, it's it's awesome. Yeah, and knowing that I'm part of that world, it's awesome. And then booking um, VO for one of the male runners, and then one of the big Seraphite Scar guys. Yeah, months in the in the VO booth, saying all the things. Check over there. Check under there. Check check on top of that. Check right. to the left. <laughs> check to the right. Look under the, because everybody can get under cars. Look under the car. Look in the basement. Look in the roof. Like every direction Everything. possible that <laughs> Ellie or Abby could be hiding in, which was, again, another wonderful learning experience. Just in-game NPC dialogue. How does this person sound different when they're lit on fire versus this person? What's what's burning up their body as the Molotov takes them over? Yeah. Will you be able to talk after that? Probably not. But yeah. Interesting. And you said for, for Taskmaster, that was body, that was voice, that was both? I was I was body at the end of the fight on the bridge, like oh, under sweet. the rebel. I, <laughs> yeah, so yeah. That's, that's my chest and my head <laughs> giving sass to Laura Bailey. Because they were shooting the scene on the thing. His body throughout the game movement, that was all Tyler King. Who cool. Made, made us both look good. Made Amazing. Taskmaster look good. Um when he's flying i'm assuming that's keyframe but I, I don't know for sure sure so it takes a village yep uh, but no i was in i was in a suit again most of the stuff was like random soldier that gets hit by cap shield during the cinematic or whatever sure. taken out um so again i was standing in. i did more vo on taskmaster than, cool than actual mocap very angry man very yeah angry man. <laughs> you got beat up by laura bailey not bad Oh, it's awesome. There was, <laughs> there was a, it got, it got cut, which, which hurts my soul, but it's okay. There was a, in Lost Legacy, she, Nadine mm -hmm. came back. 
there was a thing where uh, I was just a guard. It was at the end of like one of the cinema, you know, they're very seamless. Naughty Dog's very seamless for cinematics. Mm-hmm. We're coming out of a cinematic and then uh, they're making a plan like Sam and uh, Chloe are making a plan and then Nadine just runs off and she just goes up behind a guard and just true lies, snaps his neck. <laughs> and, everything. and so at one point I was just kind of, you know, chewing gum, having my AK and she just, Laura Bailey just came up behind me and just, <laughs> you know, cracked my neck. They didn't keep it. Ah, and I wish they did because it would have been like, That's me, right? <laughs> you killed me. <laughs> um, but it's okay because uh, Ellie cuts my guy's head off in the trailer for Ooh. he's the, the big guy with a pickaxe. That yeah, that was you. Around. That's all me. That's so cool. Uh, voice is all me, of course. The, bo- the body was a bunch of different people Chris J. Alex, uh, and a couple other people. It's again, Frankenstein takes sure. the village. I will never take credit for an entire character you, and, sure and, nor should you yuri's very good about that as well anytime yep. people praise the spider-man he's like it's me and six mm-hmm. other people in suits and then a whole team <laughs> making yep. him look and sound good and uh that's important too i think i agree because and that's what that's what's unique i think about i mean yes film and tv as well like video games knowing that there's a team of animators mm-hmm. uh working on your character if you aren't one-to-one likeness Right. You know, what what rig, what facial rig or character are you driving that that someone else is going to make look seamless? It's really it's humbling. And I think really wonderful to know that you're just a part of that. Yeah, it can be your voice. It can be your movement. But recognizing and honoring and respecting all the folks that are going to be working with that character as well. Sure. It's huge and important. I agree. Theater. That's the lighting designer. That's the costumer that that puts you, makes you look good. That's you know props. It's mm-hmm. still that also takes a village. That's kind of I think that's why I love the mediums, like especially with like film, TV, and theater, because it is a collaboration of so many people to make the one thing. Yeah. It's it's kind of it's beautiful in the process of itself. Yeah, and and if you're lucky, you make good friends in those different departments. Yeah. How did you get involved with Skills Hub? Skills Hub mainly came about for me once the pandemic was kind of in full swing. Um, Makes sense. Julia Bianco Scheffling, who is Mm -hmm. one of the most genuine, down to earth human beings that genuinely wants to see others succeed. And um, she and uh, she's uh, part of the help network, Mm -hmm. H A L P. And through that with Jennifer Hale wanting to do Skills Hub, because that's, Jennifer Hale's baby. Mm-hmm. They work together to kind of make the help network and um and uh Chip Beeman as well from the help network working with her. That's how I, I got through Skills Hub through Julia. Cool. And um it's a it's an awesome, I mean, you you've already know this, but it's an awesome source for anyone to go on, book some time with myself, with Jennifer Hale, with JB Blanc, with yep. whoever's whoever's available that week. And it's like, oh, I need some dialogue work. So like if if I got Oh, I have this Russian character. I'm, I'm not feeling 100% about it. When is JB next available? Let me book right. 30 minutes, an hour with this dude and get some of the best dialogue training ever. Right. So I, 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 was, asked, I was asked to be a coach on that. Cool. From, from Julia and then uh, by extension, uh, Jennifer Hale, who I call Commander because. Rightfully so. <laughs> uh, she's shepherd. How are you liking it? I love it. Uh, it's, yeah. it's been the best. Skills Hub has also been a, a wonderful way to just meet new people. Yeah, I've had, I'm, I'm still having nice, uh, if I haven't met them yet, nice online relationships through Twitter or Instagram mm-hmm. of folks that I've, um, that I've taught either in a workshop or in one on one coaching. And I am, I am all for making these new relationships, especially with folks that are really taking it seriously, really applying themselves, and they're, they're, they're getting joy from it. Yeah. That's the biggest thing. If I can, if I can help in some way to keep that sense of play in everything that we're doing, and that hopefully we're we're working towards getting work and something that will pay us, that feeds our soul. Yeah, that's everything to me. And if I can, if there's anything I can do to help with this audition that you have coming up, or with uh, you know a mocap reel or whatever, if there's anything I can do, I'm I'm happy to help auditions, audition techniques. Uh, I just, I had someone reach out to me randomly on Twitter, uh, who was a friend of a friend that took my workshop and said, I need help. I've never done like, like, you know, uh, um, just movement 
based vocal stuff for, for a session. I want to be able to get better at that. Sure. And so we had a mock session where we talked about, you know, pushing something, pulling something, jumping, landing, getting shot, punching somebody, hitting somebody with a baseball bat, getting hit with a baseball bat, all those things, uh, all the vocally. Those efforts. All the effort noises. Yeah. There's, there's the word. <laughs> What's today? I'm, Wednesday? I'm here for you. I have no idea. <laughs> Time has no meaning. It's a flat right. circle. Everything else has been made up. Right. So things like that. And then it's, it's really fun. And I'm, I'm not presuming I know everything. I, I, I know that I'm younger than some. And I was, I was reticent to teach early on because I was like, what can I, you know, but when I had, a, <laughs> when you have enough people reaching out saying, Hey, can you teach this? Sure. You share this with us. I go, okay. And I try to make it clear to the students this is what I've done. This is what I've experienced. Don't take it as gospel. It's like UCLA. Take what help, what's helpful for you and run with it. Yeah. And I will always be here. I give my email address to, to folks if they need follow-up stuff or if they have any questions. I, I want people to feel, and that's what Skills Hub is as well. I want people to feel not afraid to reach out for help. Yeah. And, and to get it and to feel more comfortable in their craft and what they're doing. But it takes commitment. You have you have folks reaching out all over the country and the world kind of saying, this looks fun. I think I'll get into VO. This looks really fun, uh -huh. <laughs> which I support. But I try to make it just calmly and clearly. I try to say this. This is effort. This is time. This is money. This is something you need to love. You need to love doing this if you want to succeed and and my definition of success may be different than that student's definition of success it success is not always monetary success can mm -hmm. be you just feel like a better person because you did this yeah it's fulfillment more than anything in my opinion hopefully yeah so that's how i got involved with them and and jennifer hale obviously is lovely and the best and of us has been has been <laughs> has been doing this uh, for a while and knows her stuff. And again, another gen, we've had her on the stage for a couple different mocap shoots and I've, uh, you know, suited her, I've suited up everybody yeah, <laughs> or, or, or washed their suits at, at the end of a, of a shoot day. Sure. Just everyone's so lovely. Yeah. That's so yeah. cool. So cool. What did you, what would you say is like thinking back on all the things that you've done, what's been a, a nuggets that's rang true throughout that you think might've contributed to your longevity nuggets that have rang true. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, my single that drops later this year. I like it. I want. I can't wait to see the art. <laughs> it's folk with, music. <laughs> with Kubo was just like, yeah. You know, oh, it's folk music. Okay, yeah. well, give him a little banjo then. Yep, he's oh, still there. He's in overalls. Kinda. Love it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> How'd y'all get down this path? Right. <laughs> Dueling banjos start playing. Let's go. Yeah. It's, it's time to go. Come on, Kubes. <laughs> uh, what lessons did I? Can you repeat the question? You think I remember the question? Mark? No. You know what? That happened in another one. Who are you talking to? You're talking to somebody. Yeah, and you're like, what'd you ask me? You're like, I don't remember. I don't you, come I, in with I, questions. I think the gist was good. I think the gist was um, <laughs> what lessons have stayed, what nuggets have stayed true that you found in certain. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds like something I'd say. Something you said, yeah. <laughs> I know a lot of kind of what I shared already of just kind of knowing, knowing your job mm -hmm. and working on your job and trying not to, trying to be respectful of other people's jobs, even if you think they're not doing it well. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's less the stage crew. I learned so, uh, that's, that's more so, you know, uh, again, the, those, those hiccups in communication that I've seen on a couple of different ones. Uh-huh respect the process even if it's driving you insane it's a good one there's only been a couple shoots one was like a there was a non-union shoot we had for a big game uh near the end of my mocap pa career that was i just <laughs> i wasn't i wasn't putting on a good face <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> i was nearing the end of my i was tired and i'm like oh i can't um and it's diff it is difficult to keep one's mouth shut. You find the opportunities. If, mm -hmm. if you find someone is kind of at an impasse sure. and the actor says, what do we do? And the director's like, I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, you got to feel it out. Go, uh, quick question or a quick suggestion. If you guys sure. want to take it, we could try it this way. 
if that helps you in this scene. Take it or leave it. Hopefully, nine times out of ten, it helps. Yep. That one time out of ten, it's just, who are you? (laughs) What are you doing here? (laughs) No, um, the the nuggets are be your charming, wonderful self. Uh, Try not to step on any toes. Be respectful of the process. Be respectful of what other people are going through. You will get actors coming in to get into a mocap suit and they're not comfortable. They don't feel like they look good. Sure. Maybe, or, you know, you have to, you have to have that idea of like, I don't know what this person's going through. I don't know what their morning was like. I don't know what their commute was like. Mm -hmm. And grin and bear it when it's necessary. And uh, when they're gone, take it as a, okay, I need to be, I need to keep this in mind. Should I be fortunate enough to Mm -hmm. be in their mocap shoes someday that whoever is putting on my fingers or doing my makeup, that I am patient and responsive and, and thankful to those people. Very, very few folks have come in and, and not been a pleasant to be around. A lot of the times it's, you know, TV and film folks, but again, Mm -hmm. I think it's coming from, especially if they've never done mocap before. I feel weird. This is weird. I'm in a weird suit. I look weird. This isn't going to be good for my brand, whatever it is. Right. Uh, not everybody. We've, sure. had some, we've had some movie stars come in and be extraordinary examples of a good performance capture. Action. Sure. Just, and that's usually imagination. Aha. Uh-huh. And, and ego. Lack of, of ego. I don't care what I look like right now. What matters is the data. What matters is the scene. Let's focus on that. And when that happens, everything is, I don't know what that noise was. It was, it was everything. Was That's what it was. I love it. Yeah. It's everything everywhere all at once. Um, I'm in. Yeah. So, so I guess that just, just be, be open and available to the, to the day, to the shoot, be helpful, try to be on, on deck with whatever they need. There will be in game days where it is just one poor uh, stunt performer or PCAP performer running around in circles or reloading a gun or doing move sets sure and you're just on the sidelines just you know <laughs> trying to stay uh it, it gets monotonous sure and, um, then you know this poor performer's uh, going crazy and tired and so i don't just be 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 present and be thankful that we're still drawing breath in this insane world those are good ones those are good ones do you have a dream role that you haven't done yet? Yes. It is not specific. Okay. I'll it's take it. It's not specific to an IP necessarily. Although Smart. if you if you ask me to be in a Star Wars game, you'll right. get stuck out and I'll finish it. <laughs> um the dream the dream role for me right now is to play in a mocap suit with VO yeah. a character, like like a, a written character does that make sense oh that'd be cool i love npcs i love that work i love the longevity of those um but i'd love to like again i i kind of i was about to say i grew up watching (laughs) it is it is growing up in the time that i was working on last of us uncharted 4 uh Mm -hmm. lost legacy spider-man god of war all these things i'm watching some of the greats i've i've have years under my belt now of watching nolan north and troy baker bullshit around right up until action and then they're just such pros and they cut out laura bailey jennifer hale travis willingham matt mercer my good friend jim peary who i love who's oh yeah killing it left and right if you can get him on here he's oh no let's do it tone his voice is amazing i'll tell him i'll be like please car- do. carve out an hour for brian balance yeah it's worth it. <laughs> But, but watching all of these people for years on different projects and how yeah. they work and how they do, and they make it look so easy. Of course. And it's not easy. They know it's not easy. It's really hard. <laughs> it's really hard. Um, but they make it look, but I've had now years of watching these pros. Amazing. And so there's a comfortability there that I never thought I would have. Where if you hire me for a speaking role, or the co star or whatever, or like, I don't need to be the main person. I don't want that's a lot. I just, sure. Put me in the put me in the squad. Or yeah, call it whatever it is, I will be able to hold my own. And I and just haven't right. I haven't gotten the chance to. We'll see. Five years from now, we'll reconnect. Well, you and I will talk before then. But like, yeah. <laughs> we'll be back on the show and be like, "Where are you now?" It's just. Um, but I just haven't. I haven't been given a character yet to really 
run with. Sure. And um, which is fine because I'm, you know, I'm in, I'm doing Shakespeare right now. I'm, I'm, right. <laughs> I'm, I'm directing, I'm directing voiceover from home. Like I'm still loving what I'm doing. Yeah. But my, my dream role is to be entrusted yeah. with a character that I can run with and sweat in a suit for, if that makes sense. It's only a matter of time. That's the hope, my man. I can't wait to see it. Cheers. I can't wait to do it. It's going to be really good. And dude, just like that, we've been talking for almost two hours. Look at you. <laughs> a lot of rambling, like I <laughs> you said. You marathon man. <laughs> I'm so glad you were interested in coming on. And it was a blast getting to know you. This was even better than I imagined it was. And I already knew it was going to be cool. That's awesome. Good. Before I release you into the wild, I have yes. to ask, where can people find you online? Where can they find your stuff? Twitter, if that's still a platform <laughs> yeah. that people are going to, I don't know. If you look right? at the news, it's a, it's a whole thing there now. Yep. I think it's just Walter Gray IV 007, I think. I think so too. And that then right. um, also my Instagram, Dash Rendar 007, Love both it. Star, Star Wars and Bond. And then Facebook is just my name. I'm rarely on Facebook anymore, but you sure. can absolutely find me on those on Instagram and Twitter. And um, yeah. You're accessible. I try to a certain extent. Right, yeah, yeah. I'd, love to, I'd love to answer questions. I'd love to meet new people. If you send me a message about, you know, your friend's pyramid scheme uh, that I should <laughs> be an influencer for, I will probably not respond to you. Uh, I'm, I'm learning those boundaries ever, yeah. ever so slowly. They're important. Well, dude, thanks so much. Thanks for having me, man. Of course. Too much fun. And... Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at brianbalance.com. There you'll find my demos, films, and a bunch of other really fun stuff. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps and is greatly appreciated. Let the people know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to pick you up some sweet gear. Also, I've made a Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show more directly and get early releases of the shows, you now have that option over at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Daryl, Daz, Ben, Victor, Jim, and Chris. Your support means so, so much to me, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well. <laughs>